You are listening to Diaspora Music on Black Power 96. And uh, we are on the line talking to uh, Malik Yakini from the Detroit uh, People's Food Co-op. And uh, this is an interview that we have planned uh, well ahead of time. And we would like to welcome uh, our comrade and brother Malik Yakini to Diaspora Music. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing well, Brother Norman. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Sister Melinda. And it's a pleasure to be on the show. And I, I enjoy being a listener. Amazing. Um, so welcome to the show. And, um, you know, Malik, you're, you're, you're a musician. You are an organizer. And um, the first time I met you, um, um, it was in 2017. I remember exactly. It was coming back from an artist residency. And I stopped in in Detroit because I don't know um, if, if listeners know, I did spend six years in the Windsor, Detroit area. So I, I you know, I, I try to stop whenever I'm near there. So I stopped in and, and connected with my sister Oya. And she's like, oh, do you want to come to this meeting? And it was the meeting when you guys were just getting started with the Detroit People's Co-op. Oh, wow. And it was amazing. Wow. And it's now 2024. So, yeah, I know it's a, it's a long journey, but maybe take listeners of what that looks like. Mm. Well, I'll say, first of all, there's been this long-standing relationship between progressive thinking black people in Detroit and progressive thinking black people in Toronto. And so I want to definitely give credit to one of my teachers, brother Anand Lololi, many people know him as Zola, who was one of the founding members of the African Food Basket and currently has been leading the um, the, Afri- the, the Toronto Black Food Sovereignty efforts uh, because many of the things that he modeled for us, we replicated in whole or in part. So I want to lay that, that out clearly, uh, and, and including even the founding of our, of our organization was very much influenced by the work that we saw uh, him doing in Toronto. Um, but specifically this food co-op, you know, many of us, myself and many others have been anti-capitalist for many, many years. And so, you know, we try to figure out within the context of a capitalist system, how can we create, at least on a micro level, uh, economic systems that are more equitable and that stop the bleeding of wealth from our communities and instead circulate that wealth within our communities for our own well-being. So I've been involved in various types of cooperative buying clubs uh, and food co-ops since the 1970s because of my, uh, my commitment to, to the dismantling of capitalism. Now, clearly, food co-ops are not going to cause capitalism just to, you know, to crumble, but it's a way of getting people to think about what a post-capitalist economy might look like and how we might organize ourselves in a way, again, where wealth is distributed more equitably instead of being uh, concentrated in the hands of a few who not coincidentally, because capitalism and it is the evil twin sister to white supremacy, those few who the wealth is is concentrated in the hands of typically are also white and are typically men as well because all this intersects with patriarchy. Um, So so this this idea of cooperative economics has been something that's been part of my activism since the 1970s. But specifically with this project, the Detroit People's Food Co-op, we started in 2010. Um, in fact, we you know, even before that, in 2009, we started a food buying club called the Ujima Food Buying Co-op, Co-op Club. And we started each month ordering from a major distributor. And then the people who ordered through the co-op would come and pick up a box each month. And so we did that from 2009 to 2016. In 2010, though, we started working on this brick and mortar co-op that came to be called the Detroit People's Food Co-op. And so there's a lot of steps. I don't have time to take you through the whole journey, 
but I'll say we started out doing a feasibility study with about 300 uh, surveys that we did of people at grocery stores and farmers markets around Detroit, and we did about 12 focus groups with community partner organizations around the city to determine whether or not there was enough general community support to move forward with this project. And the answer is that there was. And so we started putting all the elements in place that were necessary to do a development project, including doing what's called a market research study to begin to see how much money a store like this could actually take in each week, which you need to get if you're trying to get investors or if you're trying to get loans, you have to also be able to make the business case to the people you're getting the money from. So, you know, we went through several years of making sure we had all the elements in place learning about how the grocery business functions, uh, designing the store. We decided that we wanted to own the land, own the building. And so it made the project much more complicated than if we had just decided we were going to rent a building and just open up a store. And so um, we ended up partnering with a nonprofit development corporation called uh, Develop Detroit Incorporated, headed by a black woman named Sonia Mays. Uh, I had been introduced to her by a mutual friend. Uh, there was enough alignment in how we saw development and how we saw this project that we decided to partner on this project. Her input was extremely valuable because she was a professional developer, her and her team. Our organization, the Detroit Black Community Food Sovereignty Network that led the project, we had never developed a building before. We'd grown plenty of collards and kale and tomatoes, but we had never built a building before. And so having this professional developer as a partner was extremely valuable. Um, bottom line, you know, again, I'm, I'm really truncating the story a lot. Uh, we were able to identify where we wanted to locate it. We were able to purchase the land. We were able to get the financing in place to build a new 31,000 square foot building uh, from the ground up. And on May 1st, the Detroit People's Food Co-op opened in the first floor of that building. And on the second floor, we have the Mama Imani Humphrey Banquet Hall, named after an iconic african Center educator in Detroit. And we have the Coogee Chagulia Kitchens, which are commercial kitchens available for rental by food entrepreneurs of various scales. And the Detroit Black Community Food Sovereignty Network opened its offices on the second floor of the building. Uh, you're listening to Diaspora Music on Black Power 96. Now, uh, uh, the, the co-ops in African-American, uh, uh, the history of African people in the United States, uh, uh, was Du Bois a factor in terms of that whole question of, of co-ops, you know? Uh, yeah, and, and, yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, one of the things I love about your show, uh, is, is that you know you have such a uh, a vast historical knowledge yourself, and so you're always able to draw in you know these threads from our history, which is very important and help to put things in a broader context. You're absolutely right. Du Bois was an advocate of co-ops, and in about 1910, uh, I think, and don't quote me on the exact year, but he actually did research on all of the known black co-ops at that time and found that there were hundreds of black co-ops of various kinds. And in fact, you can read about his research in a book called Collective Courage by our good sister, Jessica Gordon Nimhart. Again, that's called Collective Courage. And she documents the work that the boys did and she builds on it. She goes beyond it and documents how cooperatives were one of the primary ways that coming directly out of chattel slavery, black people in America galvanized our collective wealth and our collective power in the face of an economic system which is hell-bent on not having us participate in the mainstream economy. So this has been the historical way. You know, in today's time period, many people think of co-ops as kind of hippie white institutions because in the 1960s and 70s, there were many co-ops that developed, some of us call them jokingly crunchy granola co-ops, you know, that developed in, in, you know, college towns and things like that. So unfortunately, many black people now kind of think that co-ops are a white thing, but it's a tool that our people have historically used uh, since right after the, the civil war and emancipation in the United States in order to 
galvanize our collective economic wealth? You know, don't you think that we as a people, uh, you know, I guess historically, uh, you know, everything is, uh, seems to uh, always revolve or always or around revolve around uh, Europeans being the leaders of. You know, we get all our ideas from Europe. Europe and uh, that ain't as Duke Ellington used to say. That ain't necessarily so. That ain't necessarily so, and that you know that's because the people who are creating the narratives are are creating a narrative that is from their perspective. So, you know, in regard to co-ops, what we commonly hear is in the 1830s, I think it was in Rochdale, England, that that's when the cooperative movement began. And, uh, you know, I don't want to deny that that uh, event occurred, but really, if we look at traditional African culture and the way traditional African societies were organized for the most part, and I'm not, let me say this. I'm not on some Africana Gloriana tip where I think that everything was perfect in Africa before uh, colonialism. You know, there was a lot of nonsense happening in Africa as well. But for the most part, societies were organized for the benefit of the group and not for the amassing of wealth in the hands of, of, of individuals for the most part. You know, and we had, we had kings and tyrants and all of that, you know. But for the most part, they, the societies were much more communal. And so really, you know, what we're calling now cooperatives is really the way that African people have traditionally organized our societies and our economic systems uh, since recorded history. And so as we're talking about cooperatives, if we want to put it in its true historical context, we have to acknowledge that uh, we've been practicing this for centuries, even though it might not have been called cooperatives. Uh, you're listening to Diasporic Music on Black Power 96. Damn, I'm wondering, is Melinda there? Or is she still gone? Well, I, I have questions. No, uh, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. No, I'm just um, wondering, like, you know, the different, you know, kind of ways we call it. Like, you know, people have susus. People have, like, different kind of modes that we call it differently um, than right. co-op. But they offer it in that's the same right. way. That's yeah. right. Sometimes, you know, right after slavery in this country, people develop what they call mutual aid societies that might have been to bury members of the group or whatever. But those were co-ops. They didn't call them co-ops, but they were co-ops. Credit unions are co-ops. Uh, and again, Du Bois recorded all kinds of co-ops, grocery stores that were co-ops. And in fact, uh, many people have heard of the great Ida B. Wells, the anti-lynching crusader, who was a journalist, the very first incident that started her on her anti-lynching crusade was when the the managers of a cooperative grocery store in Memphis, interest, interestingly called the People's Grocery, uh, were lynched. And so, uh, so there were cooperative grocery stores, there were child care cooperatives, there were educational cooperatives, there were farming cooperatives, there were purchasing cooperatives, all kinds of ways that we were working together for our, for our mutual benefit. Uh, I remember hearing Dr. Gerald Horn uh, make the statement that uh, Detroit and Haiti were in the vanguard of, uh, of the liberation struggle in uh, of, of African people, you know, in the Western Hemisphere. He you know, we talked about, you know, the resistance that African people have historically put up in uh, in uh, the Detroit area. Could you talk about? That? Yeah, well, that's absolutely true. And you, you know that firsthand from your from your experience of being here in Detroit, bro. Um, but I will say that Detroit has always had a strong history of resistance. And perhaps we should go all the way back to the French colonists and the Anishinaabe people who were here and once you know the French began taking land, there was resistance by the indigenous peoples. I wanna you know, lift them up. But since African people have been in Detroit in numbers, there has been uh, tremendous resistance as well. In fact, part of what I've been doing uh, over the last two months or so, since I stepped down as executive director of Detroit Black Community Food Sovereignty Network is I've been doing research on my own family history and even within my family i'm finding these tremendous acts of resistance uh to 
to racism and to the inequality that existed and continues to exist in American society. Uh, so in Detroit, in addition to the individual acts of heroism that we often don't hear about, um, we know that most of the major black organizations uh, that have have favored uh, either independence of black people or have had a pan-Africanist perspective have either started in Detroit or have had a prominent presence in Detroit. And we can start with uh, Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association. It certainly didn't start in Detroit, but had a very strong chapter and presence here in the city of Detroit, very strong division, I should say. Uh, the Nation of Islam started directly in the city of Detroit, and whatever people may think of the Nation of Islam or whatever critique they may have, it can't be den denied that the Nation of Islam has played uh, a critical role in the development of uh, the consciousness of Black people and the kind of development of self-love that we need to be able to progress as a people. Uh, again, started right here in the city of Detroit. We know that the uh, Shrines of the Black and Dollar, the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church, a church with a liberation theology, uh, which also has churches in Houston, in Atlanta, and in West Africa, and has influenced other churches who might not be directly associated with it, but have been influenced by the liberation theology of its founder, uh, the Honorable Jeremoji Abebe Ajima, again, started in Detroit. The Republic of New Africa, the provisional government of the Republic of New Africa, which is the the uh, governmental apparatus of the new New African independence movement, started right here in the city of Detroit. Um, uh, Shokwe Lumumba, uh, Imari Obadele, who uh, Imari served as the president of the Republic of New Africa. At one point, uh, Shokwe Lumumba was the vice president. And uh, Shokwe went on to be a founder of the New African People's Organization and the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, went on to become mayor of the city of Jackson, Mississippi, where his son, who is also from Detroit, is still mayor. So these are just some examples. The League of Revolutionary Black Workers, I can leave that out, um, it was uh, the, the most revolutionary union-related uh, movement that we have seen in this country and continues to be studied by uh, progressive scholars throughout the, excuse me, throughout the United States, and continues to be emulated in part by activists uh, to this day, and is seen as a guiding light by many people who are trying to make revolutionary change in the United States. These are some of the things, not all of the things, but these are some of the things that have emerged in Detroit in terms of black struggle. Let me ask you this. Uh, you remember that the League of Revolutionary Black Workers uh, talked about they had relationships with the Yemen. Um, many of the leadership had gone, visited Cuba, and uh, they weren't just concerned about uh, the liberation of Black people in the United States, but they were uh, internationalists. Could you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, this is past uh, week. I've been in two meetings with Brother Charles Simmons, who was uh, a member of the League and was one of those who early on went to Cuba uh, with General Baker. Um, and I'll say that, you know, that with, within the nationalist and pan-Africanist movement, there's always been at least two kinds of uh, maybe schools of thought. One, uh, sometimes people characterize as narrow nationalists, those who think that the liberation of black people can be accomplished without uh, a, a more uh, total transformation of the world. And then there are those nationalists and pan-Africanists who are also internationalists who understand that the liberation of black people is tied up with the people of the, of the world and that the system that oppresses us, the capitalism is a global system. And while it's important that we're active on the local level, we have to tie those local struggles together because the system that we're struggling against is not a local system, it's a global system. And so uh, certainly the League and many other people in the city of Detroit, uh, including Malcolm X himself, have um, 
you know, have advanced the importance of being abroad in our thinking and being internationalist. Uh, you're listening to Diaspora Music on Black Power 96. Do you have any more questions, Melinda? Yeah, I was just wanted to tie this back. This is like Black August and uh, <laughs> maybe talk about, um, you know, food sovereignty in the context of Black August and, um, you know, how does like, you know, these kind of, um, in quotation marks, co-ops, play with in, 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 in Black August. Okay. Well, so first of all, salute to all the comrades who are celebrating or who, who are uh, maybe not celebrating is the word, but who are acknowledging uh, Black August and who are studying and who are practicing sacrifice and, and increasing their discipline. And, you know, the purpose of, of these observances like Black August or Kwanzaa or Malcolm X Day or whatever is really to enliven us and to reinvigorate us so that we can more fully participate in the struggle on a day-to-day basis. It's not just to like revel in the celebration itself. It's to invigorate us to participate now in the struggle for our people. And so um, with that, Within Black communities, this growing movement to build Black food sovereignty and to have uh, self-determining food economies is part of the overall movement of resistance against the domination of our people by American capitalism, by global capitalism, and by white supremacy. And so, you know, co-ops in and of themselves are not going to free us. Community gardens in and of themselves are not going to free us. These are tools that we use to organize our people to uh, create greater control over the economies in our community, to uh, model, as I said earlier, what a post-capitalist economy might look like, what the relationships within that might look like, to get people to begin to break their thinking out of the monopoly that capitalism has on how we see the possibilities for structuring human society. So these gardens and co-ops have all kinds of positive things that they can do, but then uh, in and of themselves, they're not going to cause capitalism to crum- crumble. And so we have to clearly make sure that we're tying the development of Black food sovereignty into the larger struggle for Black liberation and even the larger global struggle for the dismantling of capitalism and for the creation of global systems that are equitable, uh, are uh, that honor the planet, because that's the other thing, even uh, you know, if we're creating socialism, for example, we don't want to create it in a way that still only sees the earth as a commodity that we extract from. This is how capitalism sees the earth. But in many cases, socialism sees it the same way. And so there are many people now identifying themselves as eco-socialists. We want to make sure that the new economic systems that we implement not only are equitable and fair human beings, but they also have a consciousness of the relationship between human beings and the planet and our responsibility to be sustainable stewards of the planet. Uh, We only have four minutes left. Uh, Is there anything else you would like to add? Yeah, I want to let people know, um, since this is a music show, that I play in a band called Molly Wap in the city of Detroit. In fact, we just rocked the stage last night at an event uh, in Highland Park. Uh, Highland Park is a little city inside of Detroit, and Brother Norman, I'm sure you, I'm sure you know where it is, because uh, Brother General lived there for for many years. But we rock the stage in an event called Reggae in the Hood, and so it was an outdoor event. Uh, it was a really really nice event, and we've been doing several outdoor festivals. Uh, you know, a lot of community organizations call us because of the type of music we play, which is conscious music, you know, designed to get our people to think more deeply about our culture, our history, and also about participating in our struggle for liberation. So we would encourage people to check us out. Molly Wap, uh, we're on uh, Facebook, we're on Instagram. They can go to our website, which is mollywapjams.com, W-O-L-L-Y-W-O-P-J-A-M-S.com, mollywapjams.com. Well, we're going to play a a little, a little Molly Wap, and uh, we would like to thank you, and we will definitely be bringing you back, sir. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And we're going to play a little Molly Wap right now. 
And uh, all right, yeah. stay in touch, sir. Thank you. You stay in touch. Thank all right, you. and my pop to Melinda. Thank you. Come the time when you must listen. Listen with your heart and your soul, and you will hear the ancestors calling, calling us to duty, to work. Dum 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 ba.